Hey everyone, this is Mike O'Brien, director of the Vineyard School of Worship. We release new music on the first Friday of every month. Our latest single, Sons and Daughters, was born out of a spontaneous worship moment at one of our recent worship leader retreats. Featuring the powerful vocals of newcomer Kyle Howard, Sons and Daughters carries the life of that spontaneous moment into the final recording. This is who we are, sons and daughters. We're crying out for your living water. We need the Perfect Father This is who we are Sons and daughters We come as your children Say yes to your Father Find Sons and Daughters and all of our singles wherever you listen to music. Any thought of anything other than just trying to lift up a sincere childlike prayer to the Lord that perhaps others could sing with me. Like that kind of motive, I think is helpful as you approach taking this little idea and just saying, I would like to finish a song that perhaps others could sing this prayer with me. That mentality really, I think is helpful yeah. as you try to craft song prayers, I call them. We're not trying to write a bunch of Christian jingles and country hits here, Christian hits. We're just trying to capture a sincere idea and then through the craft of good writing, finish it so that perhaps others can sing along with us. And when they do, it, it acts as like a catalyst in their heart to the Lord. Something inside them goes, wow, yeah, I never thought of saying this to the Lord quite like this. You're listening to the Ferment Podcast, conversations about worship and transformation. Today's guest is Paul Balash. Paul is a well-known worship leader, songwriter, and recording artist with Integrity Music. This episode is brought to you by our friends at worshipteam.com. Worshipteam.com comes preloaded with over 12,000 songs, with new songs being added all the time. Hillsong, Bethel, Vineyard, Six Steps, Jesus Culture, just to name a few. Service building with Worship Team is a snap, and all the songs are completely legal and licensed. You can also find them on social media, Facebook at worshipteam.com, Twitter at worshipteam, Instagram at worshipteam underscore WT. Visit them at worshipteam.com for a free trial today.
complete worship planning with thousands of songs, easy interface, mobile apps, and legal rights for your church. All you need in one place, worshipteam.com. Hey, good morning, Paul. How are you doing? Good, Adam. Good morning to you. Hey, thanks for coming on the Fermit Podcast. Thanks for having me. <laughs> I understand that you're in New York City right now. Right, right. Well, I thought before we get into the things that we normally tackle on the podcast, it would be great to just to hear how New York is and how you are and what's the city feel like right now? It feels oddly empty. Yeah, we're in Manhattan. Now there's places like Queens maybe or Bronx or Bro- my son's over in Brooklyn um, that we haven't seen and in almost two months now, even though he's in Brooklyn, because it's still just not, you know, appropriate, apparently. So that's all good. I mean, we do FaceTimes and all that, but just the city itself is pretty quiet, really unusually quiet. You know, you're used to the din of, uh, you know, beeping cars and sirens. And uh, there was a lot of that actually early on. You don't, you don't hear that as much, sirens so much. But, um, but actually every day in New York, frankly, you just hear a lot of sirens and horns beeping and, and lots of people. And it's, it's quite fascinating how empty it feels. Amazing. Amazing. How have things been with you and your family and just COVID-19 in general? You guys stay clear? Yeah, we're all, we're all healthy, thankfully. Thank yeah. you, Lord. We really are uh, grateful that uh, I have three grown kids. My daughter is married, lives in France, in Aix, Aix-en-Provence, and she, uh, is a, um, she teaches at a university. So her and her husband both teach at a university. So they've been able to continue to work over Zoom. Um, like we are here. That's it's right. fascinating. Uh, they finished out the whole semester on Zoom. and then, uh, But they've been healthy, of course, quarantined a few weeks before we were. And she was kind of giving us a heads up, like, it's probably headed your way. Like, you're probably two weeks behind us. So um, anyway, our son's in Brooklyn. He just finished law school literally a week ago. I'm, I'm wearing his hat here that he sent me a month ago. But he did a project, you know, he's been a musician. He did a theater undergrad and did music and all that. He did a project with integrity called uh, Labyrinth, which is like a scripture scripture project, verbatim scripture set to really cool music. But he just uh, could make a living. So he uh, took the LSAT and uh, anyway, just finishing three years of law school, literally a week ago. So um, he doesn't know what that's going to look like, what yeah. he'll do, but he's a... Anyway, and then our oldest daughter lives in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. She has three kids, little, little kids, Um, just even a baby right now, six months. Is that Amish uh, country? It is. It is Amish. She's she's not Amish, but it is Amish country. And uh, yeah, they're doing great, thankfully. So we feel very fortunate and try to keep a thankful attitude and look for ways to help our neighbors and be encouraging as much as we can to those around us, you know. Mm, That's great. That's great. Well, thanks for giving us the update on New York City. I, I think about it often, especially during this moment that we live in. Well, here's what I thought we'd do now. I thought we'd maybe shift gears here and, and go a bit lighthearted, just for fun, okay. if that's okay. Uh, a, a couple quick hitters. Paul, sports or books? Sports. There we go. Stones or Beatles? Beatles. Plan. I like both, but yeah, 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 yeah. yeah see, yeah, it's it's These a good painful, and I like books too. So yeah, that's right. <laughs> Planned party or surprise party? Huh. Gosh, of course, every one of these is like either one. I'd be fine, um, but I'll say surprise. Okay. Old guitars or new guitars? Old. Old guitars. Yes, okay. Last one. Here. Favorite quarantine snack? Ah, uh, man, chocolate covered almonds. Chocolate covered almonds, solid. That's yeah, a solid dark choice. Dark chocolate, dark chocolate. Almonds, yeah, you can man, convince gotta... yourself they're healthy, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Well, well, that's awesome. Yeah. All right. Hey, let's talk a little bit about leading worship. That's really one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you. This podcast is yeah. called the Ferment. It's conversations about transformation and and worship. And a lot of the people who are listening are worship leaders. They're pastors, and so uh, this would be really on point for us. Um, I'd love to just hear some of your story. How how long have you been leading worship? Well, you know, I'm, I'm I'm getting up there in age, so I've got those three grown kids and some grandkids. So that that's a tip off right there. But I don't feel that old. Um, it seems like yesterday I was growing up just outside of Philadelphia in South Jersey. Um, grew up in a sincere Catholic home. 
uh, pretty much we lived a couple blocks from the the church so everything we did was kind of based around the church and I was an altar boy I went to Catholic school uh, started playing guitar in eighth grade started you know we had a garage my, I mean not a garage actually but a basement my parents had one of those classic or typical sort of suburban uh, northeast small homes with a six foot ceiling in the basement. So we would just cram our Marshall amps and our drums and a B3 <laughs> organ. And, so it was quiet. And the house, <laughs> oh man, the house would shake. Yeah. God bless my dad. Sometimes I'd go up just to get like some water while they were just still jamming on something. And he'd be like, the TV was on super loud. He's listening to the baseball game, trying to read the newspaper and God bless him. Yeah. For that their willingness to to let us just crash there and a couple guys in the band were over six foot so they were always like bent over but anyway um yeah played you know all through high school different bands rock bands classic rock etc and then um, got in a pretty good band in my last year right out of high school i played at the jersey shore that summer and the jersey shore did you run into the boss it's a thing, exactly. Every kid from New Jersey, you just think, man, I'm at the Jersey Shore. I'm just like two steps away from Bruce Springsteen. That's it, man. Tramps like us. Baby, we, we were, were born, born to run. To run. You know? Ba-na-na-na. Exactly. Classic. But mm-hmm. sure, that energy and that just that blue collar sort of like, we're going to get out of this trap. You know, we're going to get out of this <laughs> crappy town. You know, we're going to break out of here. Every one of his songs is that kind of yeah. motif. Let's see. Well, then, anyway, long story short, man, that that year was that summer was amazing in some ways because it was like my ultimate dream playing in a rock band. This is killer every night till four o'clock in the morning. This is amazing. And uh, but I became really disillusioned about halfway through the summer. Uh, the guys that I was playing with were really into a lot of drugs. So it was like drugs. It was your classic like 1980 experience. You know, like it's like a, a VH1 Oh, behind the music. Exactly. Behind the music, VH1 video kind of story. And um, anyway, I I just felt like as best as I knew on Sunday mornings, I'd get up around noon with a hangover and kind of walk over to this Catholic church at the shore and sit in the back pew. And it's all I knew. And I feel like God heard my heart. And just um, I started running into people that talked about Jesus like he was real. And that was... um, that was really new. I'd never heard like people that read their Bible and talked about the Lord and prayed. And they were like kind of my age or a little bit older. I was like, man, that's fascinating. And so I just kind of got to know them. And before you know it, they gave me some books to read and got pulled into more stuff and went on some weekend conference with them. And there was a band playing. And before you know it, it was a classic Billy Graham moment. I mean, I went up along with my older brother who happened to be with me at this event. And we went up and just gave our hearts to the Lord and heard the gospel and um, just really came home from that weekend radically different. What did your family think? Um, They were concerned, you know, they thought (laughs) thought it seemed very cult-like. Yeah. Did they think that you were in a cult? That was going to be my question. Yeah. Yeah. Seemed very cult-like indeed. And, uh, and of course, sadly, I mean, right off the bat, we were super anti-Catholic initially just so, you know, we kind of created this maybe unnecessary sort of uh, division. I mean, I think now I would have discussions with like, let's talk about theology. Let's talk about, uh, however, you know, looking back, my mother was a praying mom. I mean, she was a prayer warrior, always prayed for all us kids, all the grandkids on her knees, you know, like, I don't know. I think God hears Heard those prayers for yeah, sure. Yeah, he does. So, That's anyway, great. I started hearing Christian music on this AM radio station in Philly. I'd never heard that before. It was like, whoa, this is so cool. I'd, it's like pretty good music, and it's about God. Like, how do you do that? Where do you find that? And uh, began to run across different names. And um, before you know it, I decided, you know what? I've been playing for years, but I'd like to, you know, kind of get all this. Uh, if I'm going to do this, I need to kind of get my theory and music, all this other stuff. So I moved to California and went to a music school for one year, uh, like a music trade school in North Hollywood. I met a singer named Kelly Willard. So here's my vineyard connection. Okay. So I was just trying to find people that did this kind of music and here I'm doing music school, but on weekends I would show up at this, uh, well, I went to this church where she was playing and I got to know her and her husband and they invited me to come hang out at their place on weekends. So it was right near Anaheim Vineyard, actually. So it was in Santa Ana, 
man, every weekend I would drive down there in my little 240 Datsun, barely can make it down there. And um, they were just just awesome to be around people that were in ministry, were doing music, and uh, I'd kind of hang out. You know, she'd go, I have a session tomorrow. Like, I was definitely on about three vineyard sessions back in the day that Kelly Willard sang on. I mean, I can almost remember the songs. Um, but it was it was Vineyard and it was Maranatha Music. Those were the two that she would get called to sing solos on. And um, then I have a not, a not so proud thing. I used to go to the Vineyard Worship. I love the Vineyard Worship, but I really was into Chuck Swindoll's teaching. There was a guy named Chuck Swindoll. Yeah. A very revered pastor of the word, teacher of the word. Amazing guy, right? So anyway, long story short, me being an early 20s, non-committal kind of guy. I would drive to the vineyard worship and like for 45 minutes of John Wimber. <laughs> John Wimber, David Ruiz, uh, maybe um, who else was there at the time? Gosh, um, you know, Hosanna, Hosanna. Carl. Yeah, Carl. A bunch of those guys, right? Uh, Eddie Espinosa, yeah. you know, change my heart, oh God, yeah. make it ever true. And anyway, after worship, you would I'm embarrassed jet. to say, would kind of <laughs> slip out the back. Get in my car, drive down just in time for Chuck Swindoll's sermon. There you go. You had it. You had it pegged. He's nothing, you know, nothing against John. John Wimber is amazing, but yeah, it was just so kind of free form and yeah, no structure that where I was at in my walk with the Lord, I was into like Chuck Smith from Calvary Chapel. Yeah, and Chuck Swindoll. Anyway, amazing, great so, story. Sorry. This is so long, and no, you it's great. asked a simple question about how did I get in the worship leading. So yeah. I really was just playing guitar for these other people. That's the bottom line. I still hadn't written a song or led worship, and I'm in like now you know, early 20s. And um, then I helped Kelly and Dan move to Muscle Shoals, Alabama. Then I ended up moving there a couple months later and living with Lenny LeBlanc and playing guitar for Lenny. Lenny LeBlanc, uh, We years later, we wrote a couple songs together. Uh, above all was one of those songs and a few others. Um, but he was just like a big brother to me and he had had a big time secular career and he knew all the Almond brothers and all these classic rock dudes. And here, here he was just such a humble, broken guy. He was led worship at the church and he was like the janitor. And I learned so much about just his heart and humility and authenticity and Kelly Willard too, both of them. When I look back, I'm so grateful for their example, because they weren't trying to be anything. They weren't trying to be cool. They weren't, they were just really authentic. And um, would you say that those two mentored you? Those are your absolutely. early mentors? Without a doubt. Yeah. I mean, not like an official program. That's right. But just, and that would be like, if I'm pulling a principle out for anyone that's listening, would be, um, I would encourage you to look for ways to serve Others who are in ministry, who are doing something that you feel perhaps called to, serve, find a way to serve them, to be a blessing. And it may not be what you think. Like I thought, oh, I'm just going to play guitar all the time for them. Well, a lot of times I was mowing their lawn or kind of babysitting their kids for two hours while they went out on a date or I washed their dishes when I was hanging out in the kitchen. And then sometimes they'd say, hey, I got a gig next Friday and we're going to do a, we're going to add a few more bands, uh, more players. You want to be, want to play guitar for that? And be like, oh yeah, amazing. Awesome. Thank you. So. Yeah. There's just something so, about being available and being around, isn't there? Absolutely. Uh, it's beautiful. Absolutely. So then I moved back to Jersey, ended up getting married to this Rita and we, we were there for a year and then Kelly moved to Last Days Ministries with Keith Green, Keith and Melody Green had a ministry. So we drove from New Jersey down to Texas, lived in a, well, we lived in their motor home for a couple months. And then we graduated to a mobile home. <laughs> it was about 25 mobile homes. And, and then we'd all share dinner together in a big cafeteria. The meals were like in common. And uh, it was like a commune. Last days ministries, just amazing, amazing. Uh, uh, you know, looking back again. So we thought we were going to be playing guitar and singing for Kelly, but instead ended up mowing their lawn, giving guitar lessons, um, doing whatever I could to be. A, so there's the local church there where YWAM, a lot of the y, the big YWAM school would plug in there on weekends, the last stage ministries, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I started just playing guitar there. So within the first two or three months, one time the pastor did turn to me and said, Paul, 
were after his sermon. He said, Paul, why don't you come on up and lead us in a, in a few songs while we have a time of prayer. And that was literally like the first time that I was like, uh, wait a minute. Like in my head, like, whoa, I don't really do that. I play guitar for other people or I sing backgrounds for them. But so it was like with fear and trembling. I don't know what the exact song was. It might've been remember the moment. So simple. The moment was just freaking out. So scared. It might've been like, <laughs> I love you, Lord. Yeah. And I lift my voice. Yeah. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but something like that, something simple back in the day. Yeah. But anyway, he he's the one that saw something in me and encouraged me after a few of those moments. Paul, we can't really pay you much, but we'll, you know, we can maybe pay you like $50 a week. Of course, I'm married now and I have a kid. And uh, we'll clean out that closet behind the, the platform there. And maybe you can make that an office. And maybe you can put a band together and just see what the Lord does, you know? Because it was pretty sort of unorganized. It was just sort of like whoever would show up and we would just play. So anyway, that was the beginning for me of just beginning to lead worship in a very non-denominational kind of thing. But I was very influenced. I'm not just saying this by the, a lot of the vineyard movement, no doubt. That's beautiful. No well, part of what I hear in your story is you're hungry and you're pursuing it, but that you're just you're also just the guy who's around. Like you just yeah. kept showing up and you're around and and yeah. and by being available in that way, you all of a sudden opportunities are 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 showing up for you. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. beautiful. Really beautiful. Well, let me let me just switch gears here again. Uh, one of the main themes of this podcast is the idea of transformation. That's why we call this podcast The Ferment. It's that things change. You know, things could start one way and yep. maybe end up different. Start out as grapes and end up as wine. And yep. one of the things that we've sort of learned over the last couple of years of just talking to so many people is that people change. And so I'm just, yeah. I'm just very interested. What are some ways that you've seen God change you over your life? <laughs> oh my gosh. I mean, one of my favorite scriptures, the old King James Version, it says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Remember that verse? I do. Uh, it's in Philippians and um, work out your salvation. So we're saved, but we're working out our salvation also. And I guess you could call that sanctification. But, you know, so a lot of life, I've been married 33 years now. You know, gosh, we, we were at the same church there for 25 years. Little did we know that we'd be there that long, just serving in a local church. And then I, we did itinerant ministry as we were trying to write songs for our church. You know, there was no big movement. There was no CCLI or, you know, I didn't, I never thought I'd actually get to do a CD. Um, but we were, me and the keyboard player would try to meet at the church a couple times a week and write songs for our church based on, oh, remember when pastor was teaching on that thing two weeks ago and I think uh, next month, isn't he going to, he's going to teach about, you know, revival or mercy or so all that to say, um, then I started a relationship with integrity music and did a live project with them. And this is all relevant. How have I been changed transformation? Well, because we can read all we want, but it's, we got to just like live it and make a lot of mistakes and be disillusioned. I was going to throw that word out there. Um, that's a good word for everyone to ponder that, when I went to Texas, we had this illusion of it's going to be this way. It's going to be amazing. We're going to, we're going to be on the road because Kelly sort of said that, but she wasn't being deceiving. She was hopeful that, Hey, you guys come down, Paul, you play guitar, Rita can sing and we'll do, we'll go on the road, we'll tour, we'll do worship concerts. And uh, we're like, Oh yeah, we're doing this. Let's go. And then to get there and man, for months and months and months, nothing really like that happening. And mostly like mowing their three acres. And like I said, babysitting their kids. Sometimes when they would go do a fly date, maybe him, <laughs> her and her husband would go like to do an event for a weekend. And my wife and I would stay home and watch their kids. So like, wait a minute here. So, and then just being there for 25 years, I'd watch YWAM people come through there and other ministry people come for a short term ministry experience. And I could see oftentimes they had this kind of expectation, but it was actually more like this. And I could see the disillusionment and I came to appreciate that disillusionment is not a bad thing. It's like, we need to be kind of shaken into what's real, what matters, 
what's authentic, what, what God's plan is and what his heart and destiny is for us. And we only know, can get to know that really in the context of community. So that's super essential. Being in that same church for all those years, I think really helped my wife and I and our kids sort of, uh, the growing that can happen in the context of community versus, you know, being by yourself. You can read your Bible a hundred times through, but if you're not working it out in the context of people that don't think like you, that are different than you, that disagree with you, that, you know, leadership that doesn't see things exactly like you see it, and people on your team that, like, you just wish they'd be more like this instead of that. All that stuff produces transformation. Hello, Ferment friends, Mike with the Vineyard School of Worship. Our Worship Leader Summer Session training is happening online this year. We've redesigned the program to where instead of it happening in one week, we're taking it in smaller chunks throughout the summer. So you're gonna get training in two hour increments every week with live training and a coach at your digital table where you can discuss the content with like-minded worship leaders in either English or Spanish. It's gonna be really, really good. We've got teachers and trainers from all over over the country, go to VSOW.org, use the code FERMENT15 for 15% off. Now, this is geared for worship leaders age 18 to 35, but anybody can download the content. We've got three tiers of training. There are really, really good options for you. If you're a worship leader, pastor, you just want to go deeper, deeper into the ministry of worship and what it means practically, theologically, biblically, we're going to go there this summer. VSOW.org. Use the code FERMENT15. We'll see you this summer. Take care. Part of what I hear in your story, Paul, is earlier when you were talking about being in the band on the Jersey Shore and like rocking, and then halfway through the summer, you kind of become disillusioned with that. And it becomes the, it becomes the catalyst for you really finding your own walk with Jesus. And then I kind of hear some similar notes, like you move to Texas, you think it's going to be A, but maybe God has B for you. And it becomes this invitation into something that maybe lets your roots go deeper with God. Yes. I, yeah. I don't want to put words yeah. in your mouth, but does that feel like there may be a thread there? That's that's really good. That's great. Yeah. That's a great connection. That's true. And and so ultimately it leads to a deeper surrender. I think our Christian walk, you know, we just surrender our expectation. We surrender well, ex- expectation is a, is a key word. I think we learn to surrender some of that. Even in a marriage, sometimes you can go into a marriage and you have these expectations And, you know, if you're really committed in a loving way to this other human that God put in your life, then that's what transformation will happen in your heart as you die to your, you know, your selfish, you know, I say selfish, uh, some of it's selfish. Some of it is, uh, yeah, some of it is just wanting things our way. Like we're just sort of, uh, which isn't always technically selfish, but that's for another that's for another uh, no i i feel you like sometimes sometimes we we have a vision of something that might be good but it may just not be the good thing that god has for us you know it could right you know sometimes it's it is blatantly selfish and then sometimes it's just yeah. you know misguided or or yeah. really off the page from some of the things that god is going to do in our life and we just don't know that we don't and i and i bring up the marriage in that simply that it's a, it's a committed relationship like being part of a that's right. Uh, a local body or a local team, et cetera, is, is similar in that you work out your salvation. You work through this stuff by being confronted with people and situations that aren't the way that you would have necessarily done it. Or and, and that's good for us in the long run. It's good for us to sort of die to some of those aspects of ourself because then other fruit is born from that. Like good fruit is born when we're willing 
to yield, especially in a marriage. Sometimes when we just yield, I'm not talking in a dangerous relationship. I'm just talking yeah. in, in even a healthy marriage where you just are willing to sort of surrender to having things your way or the way you think it always ought to be. And then in the, when you look in hindsight, you go, that was actually good for me. That was good. That was good for me to let that go or give that up. And I actually have, I'm a better person now for, for giving that up or letting that go. And, and it's because I was challenged by this person, either directly or indirectly. So anyway. Yeah. Love that. Let's talk songwriting here just for a minute. Okay. You've written so many songs. You've written songs that I've sung. You've written songs that the church around the world has sung. I, I'm just very, very interested when I'm talking to songwriters about all kinds of stuff. But I, I just want to know for you, uh, where do songs come from? Uh, the stork. Yeah, where, like yeah. Mommy, where do babies come from? Where no, where okay. do where do songs come from? Yeah, the stork. Well, you know, <laughs> you know, um, gosh, you know, in thirty words or less, right? So I've I've written a book called God Songs. I'm not trying to put a plug in, but I'm oh, just saying pl- for plug away, who, plug away, baby. I'll, I'll plug away only for the sake of time. In that, I'll I'll give you sort of a real short answer, but. I will just say that I just, since we had this downtime with quarantine, we uploaded a whole series on songwriting. So it's it's almost like if we got to hang out for a couple hours and you're like, Paul, talk to me about whatever you think about songwriting. This is how I think about melody. This is how I think about where ideas come from. Anyway, we uploaded that to my YouTube channel, which is just Lead Worship. So if you go to YouTube, Lead Worship, and there's a course there that's 10 modules. It's completely free. Um, and you can just do like bite-sized chunks and go through that course. And then there's a book we wrote years ago called God Songs. And it's a bit more academic and a lot of, yeah, it's, a you know, if you want to do that kind of thing. But where do songs come from? Um, I think they start with an inspired idea. And I think it helps if, if our heart and our mind is always on. Like if we have our phone, make sure our phone is in an airplane mode. Like make sure your heart, your receptors are like on, quote unquote, and uh, and you're you're alert to when you're listening to a sermon. You're not a passive listener, but you're an active listener. You're listening for like uh, you know a phrase that comes out of the the, word, the mouth of the pastor, or maybe someone prays beforehand, and just the way they phrase something, your brain goes, "Oh, that that's that's a beautiful way to say that. Wow, awesome." Yeah. Um, Gosh, we could give so many examples of that. So many. Um, what I hear in I that say, is that you're yeah. you're actually listening for songs. Like you're in your regular life, even if the guitar is yes. not around your neck, you're listening. You're Always. you're you're you just said your antenna is up, but you're 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 awake to the fact that something that could be a song could happen to you at any moment. Yes. If I'm reading a book or reading the Bible or listening to a sermon or I'm in church, just having that expectation that um and it becomes almost like it's a lifestyle songwriting is a lifestyle not as a way that just so that you can record songs and do a cd but it actually is a creative way to keep your heart connected to the lord i think that's the purest uh the purest motivation right there it's just you know we, we pray we read the bible we tithe we go to church hopefully we do those basics so just add this not as another thing to do but just as a it opens up a whole creative realm of hearing God through books and movies and sermons and prayers that come out of others' ma- other mouths and prayers that come out of your mouth, and just have a way to catalog those. You, now it's easy with our smartphones, you know, we just kind of hit your voice memo and go, da, 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 sing a melody or just a, a lyric idea. And I just collect those, almost like you're walking along a beach and you're, 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 oh, you're collecting seashells or you're walking through a forest and you're looking for Oh, wow. Look at that stone. That is so cool. Wow. That smooth stone. I'm going to, so we're saving all these inspired ideas. And then the next step, which I kind of get into on that, that songwriting course is like, then we begin to, we take an idea, one idea at a time and we worship with it. We play with it. We, with a childlike heart, we begin to maybe sing that idea out. And, and then it, we kind of get a sense of where it may want to go. Maybe it wants to be like an up-tempo sort of gathering song idea or maybe it's more of a on your face, hands in the air ballad, you know, hungry, I'm falling on my knees, offering all, you know. Yes. 
falling on my knees, you know, that kind of a thing. Or it could be an up-tempo, happy kind of vibe. So, and then, uh, you know, sometimes lately, especially the last few years, co-writing is a big deal. My, my most recent album, every song is co-written. I love the dynamic of co-writing because you don't have the responsibility and the pressure of feeling you have to finish the song and it has to be amazing. Like that's nobody can, can survive that kind of pressure and it takes all the joy out of it. So I love taking an inspired idea that I believe in a couple of those meeting with someone else that I respect musically and spiritually. And they bring a few ideas and we spend a couple hours. Hey, so here's an idea I'm kind of working on and maybe they hear something and they kind of pick up on it or maybe they go, okay, interesting. Cool. Interesting. Well, that's cool. You have another idea, maybe? Let me just hear a couple different, maybe there's one that... So there's this sort of little dance that happens, if you will, like in the room with this other person. And it's amazing. You walk out of that room three hours later, most of the time with something that just did not exist three hours before. That's the most beautiful thing. It was probably three weeks ago. During It was definitely during quarantine. I had a little Skype writing session with a couple friends. You know, mm -hmm. one was in Illinois, one was in Texas. I'm in Kentucky. We started with nothing, nothing. Mm -hmm. We yeah. started with a conversation. Yep. And in the midst of the conversation, it led to an idea. The idea led to a melody. Three hours later, we had a song. Yeah. And, and it's the best feeling. Yeah. There's just it nothing is. like it. It is. It's crazy. When you think about how much time you waste on social media, Yeah. when you could be like getting into another writing session and getting that feeling again. It's like a drug, you know, it's, it's a, because you're being creative. The worst that can happen when you co-write, the worst is you just spent three hours talking about the Lord, um, talk, making a new friend, getting to know this other person better, throwing out ideas, being creative, using your brain and your heart and your mind and your spirit in a creative way. That's the worst that can happen is that you walk out of that experience and go, well, yeah, well, let, let's, let's, um, Let's try to do this again soon, man. That's like, right. This isn't a bad idea, but let's see if we can get something else, you know? Yeah. Well, part of what I hear you saying, too, in every single thing you just shared there, one of the themes that runs through it is the idea of community, you know? Because you were talking yes. about you're going to church, you're listening. There might be a phrase in the pastor's sermon or someone might pray something and yeah. there's a little turn of phrase that's interesting or someone yeah. might share something yeah. or even the idea of co-writing. And part of what I'm hearing you say is, that there's just something beautiful about songwriting and it's communal in nature, even if the other person doesn't even know they're involved. Right. So true. Yeah. Beautiful. So true. So true. So many times, I mean, I could, if we had, and I go into that on the, on the songwriting course, but I give a lot of examples of where as a worship leader, just sometimes you're just, Hey, good morning, church. Let's stand together. And uh, quick example, I don't know what kind of week you've had, but let's, let's stand together and uh, let's just pray before we begin our time of, uh, you know, corporate worship. I don't think I say corporate, but anyway, um, and I said, Lord, we, we just come before you and we cast our cares aside. We put our doubts behind. We just set our hearts and minds on you, Jesus. Yeah. And just, you know, whatever, just a sincere prayer. But as it came out of my mouth, there was a little part of my brain that went boop, 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 like a little signal, a little alarm went off. Like, oh, that sounds almost like a song beginning. And um, I, I took that little idea. I didn't say anything in that moment, but we always recorded our worship. So later that week, I took that idea. I'm casting my cares aside, putting my doubts behind, set my heart and mind on you, Jesus. Which eventually got with Lincoln Brewster and we finish the song today is the day you have made i will rejoice and be glad in it yeah and um, i don't know if, you know again it's hard to write up-tempo songs that aren't cheesy that was an attempt at least that was yeah. an attempt on our part well i just i just love that story because it it does underscore the fact that you know i had asked you earlier where do songs come from and the truth is they're they're, they're just around us we just have to pay attention right that's it. That's exactly right. I love exactly it. Exactly right. Another thing real, real quick that might help anyone listening songwriting wise, I like to read the Psalms out loud. So one song that was written from that kind of exercise, it was, I was with Glenn Packham, just like you, we had no, nothing to go on. We just had a couple hours. I'm noodling in the key of B flat. He's reading Psalm 68 and he's reading it out loud. And I'm just playing and we're just kind of 
kind of worship, you know, trying to get something, pressing into God prayerfully. And then he reads the scripture that says, as morning dawns and evening fades, you bring forth songs of praise. Da, da, da. I'm like, oh, oh, wait, wait, say that again, bro. Say it, say it again. As morning dawns and evening, and I was in B flat. As morning dawns and evening fades. Just one note. Just always just start singing. Put a one note melody yeah. to that scripture verse. You and you bring forth songs of praise. Later, inspire. Da, da, that rise from earth. Da, 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 da. Da, da, your name yeah 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 let's do that again as morning dawn. and you can just feel that excitement in the room like okay okay this feels like uh huh i can picture sunday morning let's stand together and then da, 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 your name and don't stop just because you don't have all the words keep going keep the momentum going and i just remember going your name and you're ready for the chorus to be da, da, right about there so your name let's see your name uh you know, your name, Proverbs 18, the name of the Lord is a strong tower, right? Uh, your name is a strong and mighty tower. Your name um, is a shelter, is a refuge, um, is a something, da, 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 something like that, right, bro? So like, then you know that feeling, right? Yes, yeah, the best you're feeling. In the room and you're like, let's, let's start from the beginning again. And you just do it again. You do it again. And, and then you get another little bit, and then you get another line. And that was one of the few songs, man, seemed to be written in about 30 minutes. It just seemed to like once we, but that's a good place to start. If those who are stuck open up the Psalms, which is the vocabulary of worship, and just begin to read them out loud until you come across one that stands out for some reason. And then just put a note to that and sing that song with one note. And then if you want to go up higher than you can, but at least it's a place to start. It's oftentimes is the most difficult part. I love that. I was going to ask you, what do you do when you feel empty? Do you go to the Psalms? Is that your go-to? Psalms, I think historically, yeah, Psalms. And, and not just reading them, but speaking them out loud. I find out that I find personally over the years, there's just been something about speaking it out loud so that my ears hear my voice, speak it out, comes back into my ear. And there's just something about that exercise. Um, and oftentimes, at least NIV, I could hear some lyric, lyrical qualities. NIV, for some reason, seemed to have a bit more of a lyrical phrasing. It may not be the best study Bible, perhaps. I don't know if theologians out there, but I found NIV to be quite lyrical many times. And we wrote a, a lot of scripture songs back in the day. Yeah, well, and also just just quite honestly, all of the Psalms, they were meant to be read out loud. Like historically, more people would have heard them read out loud than, you know, than than alone in a room with a little book. You know, the idea yeah. of reading the Bible alone historically is kind of a foreign idea, especially to the to the to the people who wrote the Psalms. Th those would have been corporate, read out loud, meant to be heard Absolutely. in the congregation, right? Absolutely. Yeah, It would be like, take your favorite band, whoever your favorite band is, and you, you don't really listen to the music or sing along. You just read the lyrics quietly to yourself. But you never actually get around to like speaking them out or singing along, you know? Yeah. Uh, when I find myself in times of trouble, Mother Mary comes to me speaking <laughs> words of wisdom. Let it be. That's right. <laughs> and in my hour of darkness, the, she is standing right in front of me speaking words of wisdom. You know, there's something about speaking it out loud and then you notice when you say that this is a little songwriting thing when i find myself in times of trouble mother mary comes to me hear all the alliteration in that there's times of trouble mother mary yeah when i find myself there's all these internal rhymes when i find myself in times i i i i yeah so it's pleasing we can break that whole song down it's fascinating yeah it's it's actually it's pleasing to just to say it and to sing it 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 sparks more than just the ideas that the words communicate, but the the sounds of the words themselves are enjoyable. Absolutely. And then we'll use that phrase often in co-writing. We'll be like, man, that just feels good in the mouth. Like when you say that and you begin to just put a simple melody to it, it just feels good in the mouth. It kind of falls out where sometimes we have a word in there or preposition, something that's just a little bit too German, we say. <laughs> I say we, and that's not to pick on Germans, but it's a little harsh, you know? It's, oh, I like hey. that. <laughs> oh, I like it. Love it. 
Well, let me ask you another so- uh, question about songwriting. Talk to us about the impact of writing a genre-defining worship song. I mean, mm-hmm. just I, it, it's. I, I was just thinking today, even when I was prepping, getting ready to talk to you, just the way that a song like "Open the Eyes of My Heart" has gone around the world and has become maybe what we might call a modern hymn. You know, it's in the standard catalog. Talk to me about what it means to you to write a song that's traveled like that. Um, it's, you know, you, you start, you almost feel like you just delivered it and like, you're the FedEx guy. And like the Lord said, here, I want you to take this package and I want you to deliver it to such and such a place. And then it kind of spreads from there. So many of these songs, like, I can't really, it's hard for it to go to my ego because I know that they just sort of, I wrote a ton of average songs to find that that particular good song, if you will. Um, And I think that goes for all of us. We need to write a lot of songs that we think are really strong in order to, every once in a while, there's just one seems to fall out of the sky. So uh, yeah, I'm not trying to be false humility here. Uh, It's amazing. It's like watching, having a small child grow up, being an adult. I mean, watching my son graduate from law school and he did an album two years ago. It's like, who are you? How did that happen? Like, I didn't, I didn't do that. He did it. Like, but we raised him. We, we tried to put it together as best as we could. But then these kids grew up and do their own thing. And so these songs, yeah, when I go to France and hear, you know, church of, you know, a thousand singing, ouvre les yeux de mon coeur, père, ouvre les yeux de mon coeur. <laughs> or this festival in Holland, they go, schein met u licht in mein heart here, schein met u licht in mein heart. It's it's crazy. You're just like, wow, yeah. Lord, fascinating. It's such a simple little prayer. And I go back and remember those simple little moments where you were almost embarrassed to suggest the idea because it was like, ah, this is too simple. Sorry, it's not a great song. It's so simple. Uh, even above all is like that too. Just thinking back to just such a simple little phrase, above all, and just sitting at the piano at my church alone on a Tuesday morning and just going, what could you say about the Lord with that I, that simple phrase, above all, Lord, you're above all powers, you're above all, above all kings, above all wisdom, above all, let's see, all the treasures of the world, all, and then you're just kind of making this list and then looking at the list and above all powers, above all kings. Uh, hmm, interesting. So you're just that time with the Lord. You're just trying to write some simple thing. Keep it honest. Keep it sincere. Don't think about, don't let the cart go before the horse and think, oh yeah, I'm already going to like do this on a CD and I'm going to pitch it to this <laughs> record company. And I'm going to do this like, man, just as much as you can. Uh, there's a verse in Ezekiel that my, my pastor would often quote. He'd say, shake your hands of a bribe. And I literally sometimes would do that, shake my hands and just any thought of anything other than just trying to lift up a sincere childlike prayer to the Lord that perhaps others could sing with me. Like that kind of motive, I think is helpful as you approach taking this little idea and just saying, I would like to finish a song that perhaps others could sing this prayer with me. That mentality really, I think, is helpful. Yeah. As you try to craft song prayers, I call them that. Um, we're not trying to write a bunch of Christian jingles and country hits here, Christian hits. We're just trying to capture a sincere idea and then through the craft of good writing, finish it so that perhaps others can sing along with us. And, and when they do, it, it acts as like a catalyst in their heart to the Lord. Something inside them goes, Wow. Wow, yeah, I never thought of saying this to the Lord quite like this. Like, huh.
you were mentioning just a moment ago about the simplicity of some of these songs. And I was even going to yeah. ask you about that specifically, I guess. You know, it, it seems like some of the songs that touch the church most deeply are oftentimes the songs that feel the most simple. It's true. What does that say? There's a lesson there for all of us. Yeah. And yet we're all kind of, a, we can be, we can be fearful of writing something that's too simple. Um, one trap we fall into is trying to write songs that will impress our music friends. Don't go down that road. That's a great word. That's a great yeah. word. Yeah. yeah. It's always guilty. It's always a dead end. You get to this fork in the road and you go, well, if we just did this, it would be kind of simpler and people might be able to pick up, pick it up a little bit quicker. But man, if we did this and we added this chord and we did that, that's so much cooler. Oh man, that'd be so, yeah. that'd be so hip. And like all my music buddies, you can picture in the back of your mind, them going, dude, four minor. That's so beatly. That's awesome, dude. Yeah. And yet for some reason, it's like a little fly in the ointment. You just, mm. just a little bit. Mm. And if you would just kept it simple and just went the other way, that doesn't mean every song we do should be super baby like lullaby. It's a fine line. It's a, it's a very fine line, but yeah. again, this is what keeps you coming back to the well, the joy of uh, trying, having this hope that maybe you'll capture an idea like fishing, you know, like maybe, maybe we'll catch something that's really special today. Maybe we won't, but at least here we are yeah. and we're going to be prepare our hearts to receive something special. Well, well, Paul, let's, let's change gears again. Let's talk about your new record. Behold him. What's, what's the heartbeat okay. behind the record to you? I, I'm the always heartbeat. very interested because records come together and they're, they're oftentimes so personal and there's always a songwriting journey in there. And I, I'm always interested hearing from the person who has worked the most on it. What's, what's the heart that went into it? And the heart, what's the heart? You know, it's funny. I, I hate to disappoint you, but I feel like the heart, not disappoint you, but I don't necessarily have one particular theme. I was almost surprised to find as Integrity promoted this. They're like, it's your 22nd album. I think they included a couple sort of best of or whatever, but it's still, let's say 20. Like That's just a lot of albums. And the only way that's happened over time is just trying to stay in that habit of connecting with God through song. Like it's a creative way to pray. It's a creative way to keep my heart. And through that process, about every two and a half years, I've got about... 30 or 40 songs, let's say. And out of those 30 or 40 songs, I'm looking for the five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 that feel the strongest or that feel like they belong together. So I'm not dodging your question. No. It's just, uh, there's not like one particular theme. It's just, it's what I've been doing for the last 20 some years is you kind of, every two years, you just collect the ones that just for some reason rise to the top yeah. in my heart. And, and when I lead some of them before they're recorded, I have this sense of like, wow, this, this seems to be connecting. This seems to be helpful. This is helping others worship. I like that phrase. Will this help others worship? Like write that down if anybody's listening. That's a good sort of filter as, as your song's coming together. Say, will this help others worship? Well, and when I was listening to the record, one of the things that sort of popped through for me was it seems like one of the little themes in the record was the faithfulness of God. It seems like that idea just kept coming, you know, yeah. all the way through the record. Yeah. And I didn't know if that was something that was on your mind or if that's just something you're, you're, you've been carrying for the last couple of years. You know, I, I never get tired of singing about the goodness of God and the faithfulness of God. Like those are just themes that are to keep reminding our hearts that God is good. God is faithful. He is worthy to be trusted. He is trustworthy. I can place my trust in you. I can surrender to you because you are good and you are faithful. Like just those themes to me never tire. And also like Behold Him, that particular song is pretty much tells the gospel. And I try to do that on every album, have a song or two that tells the gospel one more time, like start it pre, you know, before creation. And then when God created the world, and then when Jesus came to earth, and then when he walked on the earth, and then his death and his resurrection, and, and his coming again, that sort of, that journey, telling the gospel story in a song over and over and over. So behold him, I believe, that was, that was the attempt. And it's also from Psalm 46, that verse we're so familiar with, um, be still and know that I am God. 
Yeah, the, the kind of the reoccurring hook in the song is, oh, be still and behold him. Oh, be still and behold him. So, and that idea of behold him is like an open the eyes of my heart. It's all about seeing, seeing the Lord with our eyes, with the eyes of our spirit, you know. Um, so that's an important theme. A uh, Real quick, one other I'll just touch on is the first song, What a Good God, was co-written with Brenton Brown. And Brenton's been a friend for so many years ago when I was living in Texas and nobody was asking me to do anything. And I had two, two and a half little kids at home. I got a call from YWAM, South Africa, Cape Town. And they said, would you come? And because I had let out music thing a couple of times at the YWAM base in, in Texas real quick. I'll get yeah. it. But anyway, so I flew all the way to Cape Town from Lindale, Texas, which was a big deal for, <laughs> for me. Nobody was asking me to do anything. It was such an honor, kind of. But you go there, like a classic YWAM school, there's eight students. And one of the students was a young guy named Brenton Brown. He had long hair, beard, he looked like D'Artagnan. I used to tease him and say, you're like a three musketeer, you look like <laughs> D'Artagnan. But he was such a cool guy, an 18-year-old, and I was maybe 28 at the time, and just having two kids. And I hung out with him that week, and we became good friends. He came over and stayed with us in Texas. Then he went to Oxford. So... And then he ended up, his first song was recorded with Vineyard back in the day. Yeah. It was, um, over all the earth, you reign on high, Lord reign in me. So he sang that at our Wednesday night church in Texas before that was ever recorded. So anyway, all that to say, years later, Brenton and I have over the years continued to write together. We wrote a song called Hosanna, Praise is Rising, where Our God Saves. It always seems to be the first song on my project. He's your, he's your opener. I, Oh, right. Exactly. Yeah. So what a good God. The first song on this album is uh, real quick. He, his house was lost in the fires in California a couple of years ago. And so um, that was just tragic. Amazing. Just to imagine losing everything you own, everything, your whole house, you know, and those his two girls and his wife, they were all fine, but they lost all their possessions. And a year later, him and I were together out there for a few days and we thought we'd try to write some. Some of the things he was saying was just, you know, Paul, it's been the hardest thing in my life. And yet we've just seen God's goodness. We've seen his faithfulness. Um, you know, each time I doubt his goodness, I just, I could see that he was with us, you know. And I was like, man, bro, bro, what you just said, that's something we got to sing. Each time I doubt your goodness, you show me you are with us. Your presence makes the difference. I've seen it every time. What a good God. Anyway, um, that was just an amazing opportunity to write with Brenton uh, on the heels of such a heavy, uh, I don't know, I was just so inspired by the way he was talking. Some of us would be so bitter and angry at God. And I know he's gone perhaps through some of that. I'll let him speak on that. But, but he was just humble and grateful and thankful. And acknowledge that God, you're, you've been with us. We see that. We've seen your hand every time, mm -hmm. even through this tragedy. And again, that's just another example of what you were talking about earlier, of how you listen for songs, even in conversations. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's that's way to, way to be. Yeah. You actually practice what you preach, habit. Paul. <laughs> that's good. Hey, two two more Thanks. questions, and then I'll I'll let you go because I don't want to take up your whole day. I'd love for you to speak to us, Vineyard worship leaders. Anything you would like to say to us? Well, first, just a reminder that you come from such a rich worship legacy. It's so rich. So much of the, whatever is good about, quote unquote, modern worship, a lot of it came from uh, the, the stream, the vineyard stream, in my opinion, and in my experience. So many of those early songs, we talked about simplicity. There was a, something about when, when a lot of early worship music was getting super complicated and, and um, which is not all bad. Sometimes you want musically, you just need a song that's really going to stretch you a little bit. And let's, let's get, let's hit some, some chords that don't fit in <laughs> to a one, five, six, that's four, right. you know, progression. Um, but there was something there was the heart, really the heart behind vineyard music. So I would just say, be mindful of you come from this rich legacy. And then uh, the next generation because uh, that started like in the 70s, and then there was guys in the 80s, guys and gals, 
so powerful. I think Brian Dirksen, I mean, he's a dear friend and him, him and I have written together and toured together quite often. And, and, and Brenton and Catherine Scott has sang on about six of my projects. I mean, every album, it would be like, well, what can Catherine sing? Or we would co-write something. So I'm not trying to just throw out names. I'm just reminding you of, you know, every one of these people would be almost embarrassed that I would like, I'm not trying to hold them up as, they don't see themselves as something special per se, but uh, I remember being in Texas and David Ruiz coming to our church and playing a G chord on the piano for about 30 minutes. <laughs> and uh, he wouldn't actually ever get around to playing a song. He would just sort of play this G chord. Da, da, da. <laughs> and we just tried to follow him and just this, the heart, this, this understanding of, of the Holy spirit and having a heart for spirit and truth, spirit, and truth not just truth not just word but the word of god but the holy spirit and and trusting god giving god room to move giving god a chance to breathe in our set list and in our our leading style um not just packing it in song number four song number five and just, you know start the click here we go but like <laughs> hey just exhale take a moment instead of maybe trying to cram six songs into 20 minutes maybe just plan three or four at the most and let the songs breathe a little bit let them kind of at the end of that second song linger on that one chord or that four chord a little bit longer and just pause a minute and let's see if the spirit you know just let let the people digest some of what they just sang and let the spirit speak to people and uh Mm. yeah it's hard to even put in the words I think you're doing great. I'm, I'm just trying to I'm just trying to convey a sense of let's make room for the holy spirit let's just not be like all right we got it thank you we got moldy tracks we got, we're, we're good we got it thank you we would never say that but our actions basically are like we're good at this we, we know how to do this i got it we got our set list we got the tracks ready we got our planning center everything boom 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 and uh, man, even if you do all that, and that's okay to do all that, but just let there be right before you walk out on that platform, a sense of like, Lord, unless you come and breathe life, this is just noise. Mm. We're just adding to the noise. Mm. So Lord, we just humbly offer our loaves and fishes. Lord, there's no way that this music is as good as music is, as cool as it is, and we rehearsed it, and it, these are great songs. And yet, unless you breathe on these, it's just, we're just entertaining. Mm. So Lord, we just humbly ask you to take these loaves and fishes and that you would just multiply them, you bless them, that you'd break them, break us, break our hearts for the people that we serve. When we stand on the platform, Lord, that we would have this image of us as a team on our knees, with a bucket of water and some, some washcloths and some sponges. And we're, we're, we're ready to wash feet. We're ready to take the dirtiest parts of the people we serve and say, we love you guys. We're for you. We believe God is for you. God is in this place. And God, and that, that attitude of being on our knees and we're, we're there to wash the hearts and minds and souls of people so that we would see healings in their bodies and their psyches and their minds, their emotions and their marriages and their relationships. So that's what God is after. God's after the people. He's his heart, his people. His heart is after his people. Just think about that. Yeah. Yeah. Just think about that. And then, so then you walk out on the platform with uh, not a false humility, it just uh, in, inside you still go out and you smile and you say, good morning, church. Good to see you. Let's stand together. But in, internally, there's a humility and a dependence and a cry in your heart all through your set list that Lord, come. Holy Spirit, come and move. Holy Spirit, come have your way. And you sort of, you kind of continue to hold out that possibility and that hope and that expectation that there's, it's more than music this morning that the Holy Spirit is going to take these simple little choruses and he's going to, as we pray them, as we sing them, that the Holy Spirit is going to use those to transform, ferment. He's going to transform our lives. He, he began a good work in us. He's doing a, a work, a hidden work in many of us. And let's believe that and contend for that. 
that God is at work in the people that we serve. God, we contend for that. We pray for our people. Break my heart, Lord, for the people that we serve. That, that kind of attitude, Lord, when I look out and see that couple, when I see that family, when I see those teenagers, God, just give me your heart for them, Lord. Break my heart for them. Give me a spiritual empathy, a Holy Spirit empathy for them as I lead. That's a great word. That's a really great word. Thanks, Paul. Hey, let's, yeah. let's, let's end with this. This is the last question I ask everybody on this podcast this season. What are you dreaming of? What am I dreaming of? What's the of? dream in your heart these days? That sounds like a great pop song title. Yeah. What are you dreaming of? <laughs> what are you dreaming of? Maybe a Broadway play. What are you dreaming of? That's Thank you for that question. I'm going to write that down and chew on that. I mean, I guess these days my dreams are I want to finish well. I mean, I don't, I may not finish for another 30 years. Yesterday, why is it? Yeah, it really gets me. But Ravi Zacharias went on to be with the Lord. Mm. What a, what a faithful man of God. Um, We don't know how many days we have on this earth. So however many days I want to finish well by God's grace, uh, one day at a time, I want to stay close to him. And I want that to leak out in my relationship with my wife. I want that to leak out on all my relationships that my heart would stay tender toward him. Mm, Great answer. You're emotional. Well, it's funny when, you know, funny when you get asked a certain question. Yeah, no, it's good. Who are you, Oprah? What are you, Oprah? Yeah, I'm totally (laughs) Oprah. I'm I'm using... (laughs) No, I'm using my Oprah voodoo right now. Uh, no, actually, come on. It's the Holy yeah, Spirit. These are, frankly, the older I get, anytime I feel tears or laughter, I just say, bring it yeah, on. Yeah, no, it's a gift. It's a real gift. Because that just reminds me that, like, thank God my soul is still alive. Thank God my heart is in heart as a stone because it sure could be. Mm. And it has been at times. And so anytime I, anytime a, a little tear or a little laughter comes, I'm like, yes, Lord. Yeah. Yes. Oh, man. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for talking to us. Thanks for sharing your heart. Yeah. Thanks, Adam. Thanks for your Mm -hmm. heart to to serve um, all these worship leaders. And I pray they would not grow weary in well-doing. I pray that just leaving you with this thought that what what a privilege it is that we get to stand on a platform. Many of us listening get to stand on a platform and encourage others each week, reminding them who God is, uh, what he's done, what he's doing now, what he's going to do. Like, in this little time in history, like we, we get to be part of that in, in each of our communities. And God uses that more powerfully than we realize. So just, just never minimize, uh, don't minimize what God can do through you, each one of you. As you may feel like you're so humble, you're just a guitar player and two singers or a piano player, a singer and a bass player. And you feel like, oh man, we'll never be as cool as all those YouTube videos <laughs> that we see, you know. Well, you know what? The Lord can do so much just in a, in a humble heart that spends time with Him. And then when you step out on the platform, and I'll throw that out if you don't mind as a plug. Also on that YouTube, we uploaded a thing on leading worship. So there's 10 modules. It's, it's free. Just go there, YouTube, lead worship. And if I could spend another two hours with you, it just talks about how some practices that sort of kept my heart from becoming jaded and cynical and uh, trying to, we got to keep our hearts alive if we're going to try to inspire others. So how do we do that? So anyway, yeah. Um, I just, I'll let you go now, but I just wanted to throw that out there if, so people could go a little bit That's deeper. Right. But um, yeah. So anyway, God bless yeah, you. Man. Thanks for coming on the Thank zoom. You. Look forward to seeing you in person someday. Yeah, that's brother. right. And we'll have to do this again. We'll just have to, we'll just have to do this again. And we'll have to talk about all that other stuff. Thank yeah. You. Peace everybody. Hey everyone, Casey Corum here, producer of the Ferment Podcast. Thanks for listening. I just wanted to remind you to check out our new single, Sons and Daughters, wherever you listen to music. All right, people, see you next time. Peace. Peace.